Good afternoon and good morning, everyone. This is Kyleen Galupski, Executive Director for the IBBA. First and foremost, I hope you are joining us today healthy and safe um, as we all go through these challenging times together and have our lives and businesses turned upside down. Um, I also want to extend a special welcome if you are here today as a guest. Um, we have opened up this webinar to include not only, of course, our members, but non-members and maybe others um, in industry um, who advise on transactions to benefit from the content that we have today to present to you. A couple quick housekeeping items, and I'm gonna quickly turn things over to our host. We do have lines muted to avoid any background noise, and we are recording this session. So we will have this up and um, available to you on demand on the IBBA Member Resource Center uh, probably later this afternoon. So if you want to tap back into it, you can find it. And that's where you can always find our recorded learning webinars. That's a very extensive webinar library there, so don't forget about that resource. If you do have a question, use the questions pane on your control panel. Um, depending on the nature of your question, we may have our host uh, answer that sort of right away or when we come to a good pause point, uh, but we'll also leave extra time at the end to go through everyone's questions. If that control panel is sort of in your way to see your full screen, you can minimize it by clicking on an arrow towards the upper left, I believe. And then you can click on that arrow again to bring your control panel back out. So without further ado, I'd like to hand things over um, to our friend, a dear friend of the IBBA community who does so much to support all of you and the association, Mr. Steve Mariani with Diamond Financial Services. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Kyleen. Uh, it, it is great to be able to, to provide this information to everyone. Uh, today, we're going to do a little bit different format. There's actually going to be almost three sections. Today, what I, I plan on doing is going through the, the two loan programs that are out there and then addressing a lot of things that's going to affect the broker industry and markets moving forward. So we're going to go through the EIDL and the PPP and then the broker info. So ju just so you know, there'll be three sections. And, and if there are specific questions for each one, maybe you can ask them during it or, or as, I, as I complete that. Um, I'm Steve Mariani, I'm Diamond Financial, I've been around for 25 years. Single most important thing today is, you know, stay safe and know we're all here for you and, and have your backs and we'll support you however we can. Um, th there's so much confusion out there and, and I am going to start with this simple disclosure in the very beginning. You know, things I put out last Tuesday were outdated by Friday. So what I'm going to address today, and, and let me tell you how I secure my information. Me and four or five lenders get together every morning and discuss all the changes because these things are changing daily. Uh, so what I'm going to propose today is things that I've even learned since last night. So this again is open to change. I don't want to see hate email saying, hey, you said this, but it's that. Things change hour by hour. So this is the most current information that we have as of this morning that I can find. And it is a compilation of a bunch of different sources. So between Nagel, Nagel is the National Association of Government Guaranteed Lenders. They put out information, the SBA puts out information, lenders put out information. So, uh, you know, deciphering it all is, is a difficult job and that's what I've spent my last 14 days doing. So here's the, the summary of basically what I've learned up until today. These are the two major loan programs, the Economic uh, Injury Disaster Loan, the, the EIDL. This and we'll get into the details of each of them. And then there's the Paycheck Protection Program, which everyone I'm sure has heard of. And we're gonna go through them both in detail. The EIDL, what you need to know. So this is the one that everyone's heard about on the SBA.gov website. The only place you can secure this funding is the SBA.gov website. This is not going to be handed out to SBA lenders or your local banks or anybody else. This is for businesses that are usually affected. Here's what matters to me. So I've been getting calls over the last two weeks by clients I haven't talked to in years and years and years, and everyone has the same question. You know, how do we apply and, and is it right for me? Here's the single most important question if you're talking to a client or maybe even your business. Uh, I ask my client, do you need money today to keep your business afloat? If you do, and that's the critical level that you're at, 
you have to get this economic in, uh, injury disaster loan and EIDL and go and apply for SBA right away. That's not the majority of our calls, but there are some people affected by this. If you look on the right, there's a list of eligible industries and they've actually opened this up to a lot of industries that weren't eligible. But uh, these are the ones that we know are severely impacted by this. Those are probably the businesses or, or many of them that should be going after the EIDL loans. Um, you know, because their businesses are basically shut down. Hotels aren't doing business today. So this is directly affected businesses uh, and these loan programs. Uh, and let's go to the next slide. The loans are up to $2 million and they're under great terms. Their loan terms can be up to 30 years. Well, for a hotel, that's going to be a great thing. A lot of the, the real estate deals. Uh, but funds can be used to, to, for fixed debts, payroll, accounts payable, whatever. This is basically a real loan. This is going to be a full application also. And we'll get into that in just a second. Credit history. Must have acceptable credit history to the SBA. They're going to go through this just like you are applying for a regular 7A acquisition loan or any other SBA loan. Repayment. Determine if the business can repay it. Um, eligibility. There again, it, it's basically on the ones that have suffered. Those are the ones they're looking at. The good news is the interest rate's 375 fixed for up to 30 years. So I, I describe to my clients, if they are looking for big sums of money to help them, then this is going to be the avenue that they go after. Not the majority of our clients. The majority of our clients are in relatively decent shape, and uh, we'll get into that in just a bit. But the collateral requirements, if the loan is under 25,000, then it doesn't require collateral from my understanding. And again, these are all our understandings and our interpretations of everything that's out there because you can be overwhelmed. Uh, but this is what we found to be the most uh, reliable. SBA will take real estate as collateral where available. Uh, SBA will not decline a loan for lack of collateral. As you can see, these collateral requirements are basically what a standard SBA loan would, would require. So that's basically what the EIDL is with a little lightened up requirements cash flow wise. So how uh, here is the difference directly between the regular 7A loans that we're all familiar with and the EIDL. Uh, in the EIDL, it's coming directly from the US Treasury. There's no lender in between. There's no underwriting produced by a lender or, or anything like that. It goes directly to SBA. What I am hearing is it takes a couple of days once you get a, a number, which is something else I should expand on in this program. If you go into the SBA.gov website and you try to apply, it has initial questions that will determine whether you're eligible or not. So if you have clients or, or your offices and you're not sure if you're eligible, you, you answer, I forget it's eight or 10 questions and it will automatically determine whether you're eligible or not. So if you have anybody unsure, let them go there and fill it out. Uh, no obligation to take the loan if offered, which is another great thing. I'm telling a lot of my clients, just go apply and we'll make that decision once we actually get approved and we know what the amount is. There's no downside if there's no obligation to take it. And I've been telling them because the PPP loans are still not available, but these have been available for many weeks. So if there was a client that needed cash, this was the way to go. Um, they can't have existing uh, SBA disaster loans. This is important for the older companies that picked up some of the disaster loans in the 09 crisis, because there were quite a few of them handed out back then too, but it doesn't automatically kick you out of this. There's a bunch of required forms and old tax returns and everything else. Like I said, it's basically what a 7A loan would require. Ineligible businesses for the EIDL. There's not a lot of them, but there are a few. Uh, I am talking to some brokers that, that work with organizations not eligible, uh, but the, the list is short. They tried to include more, but there again. Now, this is the Paycheck Protection Program, the PPP. This is more of the hotter topic these days. Uh, the, the EIDL is a straight loan they can go and um, handle that pretty much on their own. When you get into the, the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, this is really a little bit more complicated and a little bit more action required on your clients and maybe your offices, but this is the one that everyone asks us about every day. So here are the basics on it. The uh, Paycheck Protection Program, it's a covered period, basically what it's going to do, and, and I'm gonna summarize this and not read every word for it, but what it's going to do and what it demands is your last 12 months worth of payroll. Uh, for, for most businesses, it's going to be uh, March 1 of 19 through March 1 of 2020. 
to determine the two and a half months of payroll. So what this is, is the covered period. You see it from 215 to 630. Anywhere in there, you can have two and a half months of your expenses paid for. And we're going to get into the, more of the details in just a second. But the highlights are there is no personal guarantee whatsoever. There's also no SBA guarantee fee. This says the maximum interest rate is 0.5 but you're not paying it during the deferred period. If you look down here, initial deferments are six months. There's no prepayment penalty, no personal guarantee. So what, what this is, is, and we'll get into also the criteria that can be covered in this, what's called covered loan. But what this is, is the government is willing to loan you money for two and a half months worth of payroll expenses and overhead, including lease payments, insurance, utilities, there's a whole myriad of covered expenses. Uh, determining that two and a half months is where the little tricky part comes in. But I'll, I'll go through a little bit more of that in just a second. The eligible lenders, th this is where, again, all current SBA 7A lenders are eligible to, to produce this program and, and all FDIC banks. So this is going to be produced by more local banks than SBA lenders. SBA lenders are really going to, and all lenders are going to service their own clientele first. And let's see, maximum loan size. And I'll talk more about the lenders in just a second. Uh, the paycheck protection, 10,000 or average monthly payroll cost times two and a half times. So what it is, is after you determine what your payroll was for that 12 month period from either three, one, and, and that's a moving target, it's 12 months prior to your application. So if you apply four, one, then it would be from four, one, 19 to four, one, 20 to determine your payroll. If your payroll, as an example, is $400,000, you will then determine, or oh, let's use easy numbers because there's 12 months, $120,000. That would mean your payroll would be $10,000 a month. So in theory, payroll expense wise, you're looking at about $25,000 because it's two and a half times what a monthly average payroll would be. Now, aside from that, we're gonna look at your rent and, and do a two and a half times that. So if you're paying $1,000 a month rent, well, that's gonna be another $2,500. You can include from what I understand, again, this is all the, the lender's conversations, utility payments are gonna be covered too. We're gonna to look at your, uh, your gas, electric, whatever utilities you might have, which I'm considering also as internet and telephone. Okay, so these are the things that we're going to apply for under this program when we ask for this loan because that's what it is. Once we determine what all of this equals to, we're going to then ask for a loan for this amount. And I'll get into the details of that in just a second, but other things that are covered. And this is where everybody's work comes in because this is the work you have to do to determine what your number is for your loan. Okay, interest is on mortgages. If you own the real estate, you cannot write off the principal payment, but you can not write off, but uh, determine what the interest is and include two and a half months worth of interest on your mortgage. If you are renting, then the entire lease payment can be the two and a half times. I'm also looking at um, HOA dues, other expenses directly related to your real estate, that if you're in a lease facility, I'm expecting those to be covered also. So this is what the program outlines right now. Employee compensation, cash tips or equivalents. I mean, these are all the things that equal your payroll. Now, where it gets a little bit more tricky, I mean, typically I, I see my clients asking their payroll companies, uh, well, produce my payroll report from 3-1 to 3-1 or whatever that is. Things that may not be included in there that you have to be aware of. Sometimes there's uh, health insurance reimbursements that are not included in payroll. There are uh, 401k or simple IRA employee expenses that are not included in payroll many times because you have a separate uh, uh, company handling your, your retirement accounts. Uh, you have to make sure you, you're exploring all the employee expenses costing wise to the employer, okay? So we're not looking at what it costs the employee, but you're looking at all the expenses. And there is some that, that I was made aware of this morning, some taxes that you have to deduct now is what they're talking about out of the, the payroll reports, but I'm not gonna 
speak to that as of yet, because that's something that just came up this morning. Uh, my understanding is you take the payroll report, you make sure your your health insurances are included in your IRAs and things, and you just determine what two and a half months of that equals. So that's my understanding. But like I said, this stuff changes, and it's going to be actually distributed by your local bank. So they may, they shouldn't be changing much of the criteria. Uh, I, and I will give you the actual criteria and the actual documents at the end of this webinar. We did receive them finally last night was the first time they became available. So I will share those at the end. Ah, more information on the Paycheck Protection Program, loan forgiveness. So we, we go back one slide and I'm not gonna go back, but I am gonna describe. So we've determined that our exposure for that two and a half months when including all of those expenses, let's say comes out to $100,000, okay? Now, once, once we get past 6.30, June 30th, we have to then go back and explore to make sure we haven't reduced our salaries by more than 25%. If we've kept all our staff and all our expenses exactly the same, any time after June 30th, we can now go to the lender and ask for forgiveness. What'll happen at that point is we'll be handing them the exact same reports, all of our payroll reports, uh, HRA, whatever expenses we have included it to, to prove, yes, we've kept all of them on place and all of these expenses were still used for all of these reasons. Once you do that, anytime between June and December, that loan will be 100% forgiven. Now, under the scenario that you, you have had employee layoffs, well, if it's between 100% of what it was last year, meaning you kept the majority of the people, long as you have not reduced your payroll more than 25%, then it will, the loan forgiveness will be reduced by that amount. If you've reduced your payroll by 10%, 10% of this loan is gonna wind up having to be paid by you. It's gonna turn into this 24 month loan. Uh, all the way down to 25%. Once you get below 25%, our understanding is that you, it's entirely going to be turned into a loan because you haven't complied. But there again, that criteria changes daily. Two days ago, this loan amount that says 24 months and 5% interest. So what this is, is if you don't comply or for some reason you're not eligible for the forgiveness, then this is what it turns into. It turns into now a 24 month loan at 5% interest. Two days ago, this was turning into a 4% loan at 10 years. So that's how much it changes within the last 48 hours. Like I said, two days ago, an information I put out last week said it'll be a 4% loan for 10 years. Uh, but there again, this is what it looks like is official, but you, you can't tell it. So I think I'm advising all of our clients and pretty much you know, friends and everybody that owns a business, if you have payroll, you have to apply for this program. Here's something I was asked that I think is important. Holding companies or things like that that have no payroll at all are not eligible for this program. So if there's no payroll whatsoever, then uh, you're out. Now, it also can include subcontractors and a lot of other, other things. I'm, I'm going to go back because I'm not ready hey, to hey, talk Steve, about the We do yes. have a lot of questions that have come in. That. So at some point okay. when you think there's a good spot. Let's stop now could, for the PPP and the EIDL. Great. Okay, okay. So um, one point of clarification, you were saying 5% interest for 24 months. Your slide says 0.5% folks are asking. Oh, I'm for, sorry. For just it is a half a point. It is 0.5. That is correct. If I said 5%, I was wrong. It's 0.5%. Okay. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to go. We've had a lot of these come in. I'm going to kind of go in order that they came in here. Um, if someone applies for the EIDL loan, will they be prohibited from applying for a PPP program? Great question. And it is one that I should have discussed. If you take more than $10,000 out, of the EIDL, if you take out that initial 10,000 that I mentioned before, and I'm not gonna go back to that slide, which is an option, that you can actually roll into the PPP program. If you apply for more than that, then you can't. You can apply for both, but they are saying if you get the 10,000 because you needed it immediately, 
we can roll that into the paid tech protection and the paid tech protection basically pays back the EIDL. So you're only in one program. But great question. If they applied and accepted more than 10,000, now you're out of the paid tech protection program. Yeah, good question. Okay. And can the EIDL be used to refinance existing debt? No, according to the SBA, you can't use it to, or you can't use it for acquisitions or or refinance existing debt is my understanding as of today. Okay. And, um, sorry, here, let me get my control panel back up. For the PPP, does a business need to prove they have been affected by the virus? They're asking for a statement, but it's hard to prove. So I don't think there's going to be much documentation about, around that whatsoever. I, I don't think there's any business in America that can say in one way or another they weren't affected by it. So I was telling everyone, prepare a statement that says how you were affected. But based on the application and everything else, I'm not seeing where it's required. So I'm not too concerned about it. I don't believe that it's going to be required. Okay. Uh, another question. I know you can get an EIDL and a PPP, but the SBA has said they are going to pay six months on current 7A loans. Is that in addition to the EIDL and PPP? Also, how do deferments affect all of this? Okay, we're gonna talk about the six month payments at the end. I will talk about the deferments right now. So, what my understanding is, is if you do get, a, right now, every lender is basically giving out deferments, automatic three month deferments. The SBA put out a memo in the beginning of March that told basically every SBA lender, no questions asked, give them a three month deferral. That is supposed to not affect moving forward. And actually, when I do address the six months worth of payments at the end, my understanding is, that client might wind up with nine months total, but we'll talk more about the six months in a second. But a three month deferral is a no brainer right now for every SBA lender and every single SBA client in the country should automatically ask for it. No, no, no questions asked, that's handed out. And then a couple of questions from folks asking, are 1099 contract payments included in the payroll definition? Yes, and so are um, 1099s are, th there's a whole myriad of uh, people that are going to be included. Yeah, 1099 subcontractors, um, bonuses, commission only people, they are trying to include as many employees as they can. What I am unsure about is if those people have to apply on their own, and that's what I'm still digging down on. I'm not sure if you include them in your payroll or if they have to apply on their own. Uh, because in theory, subcontractors, you're not going to keep if you're not busy. So that's where this gray area, and I haven't really gotten into the depths of that yet. But um, but they are they are going to be compensated on some level by, you know, in one of the programs somehow, in the PPP program. But I'm just not sure if it goes to the employer or the uh, subcontractor directly. And then if you have salespeople that get base plus commission, would the combined amount be used as the payroll amount? Yes, all bonuses and everything. Now, here, here is something that I do want to talk about this. What it says is $100,000. So bonuses, commissions, whatever their total compensation is counts. But the big confusion is, and the question I get all the time is, well, my salary was 125, so I'm um, excluded. No, there is a $100,000 maximum on the payroll amounts, but you're reduced to 100,000. So let's say you and your spouse each make 150,000 in your company. Well, when you're calculating your loan amount, you must reduce your salaries to 100. No one can be compensated more than 100 and be in this forgiveness program. If you did borrow, and you can borrow more than that, the problem is it's going to turn into this 24-month loan at the end. It won't be forgiven if it's over and above $100,000. But if you've done your calculation off of your salaries with nobody earning over $100,000, then all of that should qualify for the forgiveness, if that makes sense. And but you're not disqualified. Said, Sorry, you're not disqualified if you make over $100,000. You're just reduced to one hundred. 
is the confusion. Mm -hmm. Sorry, go ahead, Colleen. So, um, somewhat similar, tan a little bit tangent off of that. Says, what about the compensations of officers? Does that count towards payroll? Long as it's included in payroll and not in distribution. Distributions are uh, are outside. But if the, if the officers are compensated via salaries and W two, absolutely included. Okay, and so that might be the answer to this next question that came in, which was, are draws to corporate partners of a company included as payroll? No, the distributions and draws, I'm going to think, are not. I have not seen anywhere where those are included. I understand from, from an expert that distributions are definitely not included, so I would think draws are the same thing. Okay. So uh, we do have a lot of questions coming in regarding that six-month provision. Yes. I know you're going to get to that, so that's why, folks, I'm not, I'm not um, posing those questions to Steve just yet. Um, question here, for the 7A underwriting for EIDL, will the collateral include your personal home? It's going to be the same. My understanding is the same collateral for a 7A. Now, something that not many lenders know and maybe brokers don't know, in the 7A program, now I'm coming off of, off of all the disaster programs and just going to the 7A program, the actual rules surrounding collateral and, and property is if there is less than 25% equity in a property, whether it be your home or any properties you own, it does not have to be taken for collateral. Now, I put that rule out there, but it is left up to the lenders to take it if they want to. But the actual SBA rule says if you have less than 25% equity, it does not have to be taken. Now, the lenders can, again, go right by that rule and take as much collateral as they want real estate-wise. You know, SBA, under the EIDL, they're saying, you know, you should use prudent lending guidelines like you would under the 7A. So uh, they will take the real estate collateral in the EIDL if it has more than that collateral amount. And there again, that's a conversation with your lender. And can you apply with any bank or do you have to work with a bank that you have a relationship with? And that's another great question because I had actually planned on using a different bank for my clients uh, until I found out, and they're a huge bank because that's why I thought, hey, that's the place to go. It's going to be a click link. You can apply online, approved in minutes and funding within 72 hours. The problem was they came back and they said, we're not going to take anyone until all of our clients are handled. So right away I thought, well, I don't want to be on that list because if they run out of funds before either their clients are handled or everybody else in the country uses up the money, that's not the way to go. So that's why I'm advising my clientele, let's go after the people that are handing your checking account that you have a relationship with and get on their short list. And what I mean by short list is they are actually taking numbers in most of the lenders that I've talked to because it's going to be a first come first serve basis until the money runs out. So yeah, I, I'd be happy to tell you a lot of the bigger lenders that are doing them. I mean, the Wells Fargo's and the Live Oaks and you know Bank of America's and all of them are going to be offering this. But it's if you're not a, a customer of those particular banks, you're going to be pushed aside for a bit. And that's where my concern comes in. So that's why I'm advising all my clients, go to the bank you have a relationship with, no matter what, get on their list. You're a step ahead. Um, kind of in that vein, have there been any discussions with your lenders about their ability to handle the influx of applications? Well, absolutely. And um, and we're going to talk about that in the next coming slides, too. Uh, if, if there's nothing else on the EADL and PPP, then I'll get into these slides, and I can address a lot of these things here. Any okay, yeah, let's do that. Yeah. And if we, didn't, if we didn't get to your question, folks, we are leaving time at the end to go through all of them. Perfect. So why don't you take us forward, Steve? Okay. So what do these programs really mean to the broker acquisition market? Because this is what's important. Lenders could be on hold for three to six months. So the conversations I'm having in the morning, uh, and maybe I should back up again, these programs will be a huge profit center for lenders, every lender, I'm sorry. And, and the reason I say I'm sorry is, they're gonna be focused on just doing these loans and nothing else. So the talk on the street and amongst all, all the BDOs or the ones that I'm really close with, which are high volume BDOs, is they may be losing and have a huge shortage in their back office for the next three to six months. And that's where the concern comes in. Because basically these lenders are gonna be cranking these through making a lot of money on them and it's gonna be a huge profit center. 
So they're putting all hands on deck to address it. And the seven A's are going to be a concern moving forward. And I'll talk more about that in a second. Many acquisition lenders are putting their term sheets and commitment letters on hold for up to 60 days. One lender that I spoke to said all term sheets are automatic 30 day hold and all commitment letters are automatic 60 day holds. And that's because they're working out the software here, determining what staff or you know how their staff is going to address all of these things. Because the minute these programs go live, every lender is going to be overwhelmed and they all know it. So this is a big concern for our industry moving forward. So here is what I've been working on. I'm trying to look at the upside for my brokers. I speak to my high volume brokers every day and we're all in this together. And, and here are some of the things that uh, I think matter and you need to know. Now, based on a summary produced and not confirmed by us as of yet, I'm going to address that question before about the six month payments, okay? And I have found this many places and it's even been confirmed by a lender, but I haven't seen it by SBA, which is why I'm saying this is unconfirmed at this moment, but Here's what matters. And this is our upside. So this is the statement. And I understand that it's someplace in this world by SBA, but I haven't found it. All right, so starting no later than 30 days after the date in which the first payment is due, the SBA will pay all principal, interest, and fees on existing SBA loans for six months, pursuant to the 7A Community Advantage 504 and Microloan. If the loan is currently in deferment, then the SBA will begin making payments after the deferment period. This is what I alluded to before. While a potential buyer, and I know a few of these because my friends have closed loans, that they put them into deferment. Well, now it looks like the SBA is going to make their next six payments. So that client actually has nine months of, of payment-free months. Borrowers who obtain, in the gray area, borrowers who obtain new loans under those programs within six months after the enactment of the CARS Act are also entitled to have SBA make a full six month of loan payments. Here's why it matters to us, brokers. This is your selling tool. I have one client right now that it's a $5.8 million transaction Six payments to this gentleman is $269,000. He is basically, so we have him in the pipeline. He put it on hold, added another 30 days to his due diligence. What it really comes down to is, if you're going to buy this business at all, close before September 27th. Now, there again, this is my understanding and I'm confirming it, but I found it at a lot of reliable sources. Well. You know, if he closes in September, he saves 269000 on his following six payments. If he closes in October, he starts making payments the following month. That's a huge difference. So this is really what we have to be paying attention to. And I'll, I'll, I'll also expand on the lenders in just a second. If your buyer's on the fence, calculate six months of loan payments. You know, one of my clients, I, I forget what their number is going to be, but it's thousands and thousands of dollars. You know, $270,000 difference between closing in September and October. That matters to people. So, you know, the question that, that the brokers are, are really discussing with me is, you know, do you want to buy this business or don't you? If you don't believe in this business and you think it'll never recover, we get that. Then walk. But also, no. I need that decision today because if you're going to walk, my next buyer has the opportunity of getting six months of his loan payments free. So what you have to do now is your buyers that are in your pipeline, you have to keep on a short leash. They have to either move or not because you could be uh, not producing the six months for your next buyer if it takes until October to get that next buyer. So if you have a buyer that's on the fence or really waffling or really going sideways, you almost want to kick them to the curb to get a new buyer in there so he can take advantage of these six months worth of payments. Now, that's after it's confirmed, but this is all information coming out into the broker world that matters to you. You know, if that buyer is not going to move, this is incentive for him to move, but if he doesn't want to move, you want to entertain another offer because someone you want someone to take advantage of these six months. I'm going to expand on what I mentioned before as far as the lenders and their back offices. Okay? 
Right. There's a big concern about them being overwhelmed with the amount of applications, and that's anywhere between three and six months is what we're calculating. Okay. So what we've done and what you need to do, and we're going to go on to the next, important takeaways. Okay. I'm going to tell you how to address that lender concern moving forward. First of all, we want to share all the information. You know, I, I put my disclosure out there. Yeah, this is as of today, and we're all talking about it on an everyday basis and things change, but I'm all about sharing every bit of information that I can. Apply for PPP loans today and get on your local bank's list. EIDL loans are only available at SBA.gov website. Stay in contact with your acquisition lenders. Here is what's important. You have to talk to your lenders. What we did about two and a half, three weeks ago, once I saw the handwriting on the wall, is was I contacted every single one of the lenders we have a, a major relationship with and do a lot of volume with. And some of the things that I explored was, how bad is your portfolio and how much of that is going to take your attention? How much of these PPP loans are you going to be supplying? How much of your back office is going to be dedicated to seven A's and business acquisitions moving forward? So these are all important questions that you need to ask your lenders. You have lender relationships, they've done your transactions in the past, you need to be on top of them and understand exactly where they are in this because there are gonna be lenders that you're just not gonna see for months and months and months. So I say be proactive and jump on top of this in the beginning because of those six months worth of payments. If you don't have a lender all set up and ready to go, you might be searching for a lender the day you get a, a contract signed. Um, but uh, so, so what Diamond's done is we've gone after a lot of our are smaller, more aggressive lenders that are newer to the market. And the reason we focused on that, and I'm putting this out there so that you can do the same thing, they're usually not saddled with a huge uh, bad portfolio. I mean, I have one lender that has huge deals in breweries, uh, daycares, and dentists. Well, guess who's in trouble? Breweries, daycares, and dentists. Well, all their attention is taken up, taking care of their current client base. So, you know, you, you want to make sure you understand their portfolio and that they have the availability to, to service your loans moving forward. But um, acquisition lenders right now, you got to make sure they're going to be able to do their job. So here is also number five. Uh, you, can, you can go to our website and actually download all the actual PPP documents. There are four documents in there. There's buyer information, lender information. The actual op application is in there. Now, you can't really use it. You can view it and you can fill it out and have it all ready, but it's going to be your local bank that accepts it. And they may tweak it or do their own spin on it or whatever else. But the actual criterion application just came out last night. The delay in getting it out and the delay with the lenders pulling the trigger is the interpretation. I mean, what's been going on these last 30 days in the SBA world, just to, and not defend them, but, you know, the CARES Act, 880 pages. I have it. You know, the, the PPP loan is another 240 pages. You know, they're consistently writing this stuff and, A, not understanding what the legit, uh, logistical application is, but they're also putting this stuff out there saying, hey, go do these. And the lenders are saying, well, how do we actually execute? Uh, one of the questions, and I'll throw this out there, the lenders are saying, well, if they're not guaranteeing the loan and there's no collateral, what do they sign at the closing? There's no loan documents, really. So, I mean, th that's just a sample of some of the things that the lenders are going back and forth with on this latest information to understand what the real true ramifications are. Uh, how to document payroll how deep they're going to go. What I can tell you is in nowhere in any of this information, except for the EIDL, let's cross that off because I'm only addressing the PPP stuff. Nowhere does it ask for P&Ls, tax returns, or any form of your current gross revenue. So one of the questions before was how to prove that you were affected. Well, if they're not looking at your gross revenues and they're not looking at your actual tax returns or you know business information, then it's just going to be a statement from you. There's no place they request all that information. What they request is payroll reports and lease documentation and you know the, the four or five things we're going to include in that loan, but there's no way that they can actually tell 
your business was directly affected. I mean, logically, they can think about it, but uh, you know, I don't think that an underwriter is going to be able to make that determination because he's going to be a local bank. He's going to be, they get 100% guarantee from the government. There's no downside to your local bank keeping you, a customer, happy. So they are, in my mind, going to keep that underwriting criteria to an absolute minimum. My understanding is approval within minutes. It's more check boxes, but every lender is going to have their own criteria. So that's what you need to stay on top of. But yeah, if you want to view the documents, share them with your people or anything else or, or with clients just to give them a heads up of what's going to be required, that is the actual address to the, to the documents. And we want to share this stuff as it comes out. Okay, now I'll take more questions. Great, because we do have them coming in. Uh, um, I know. This, is, this is a great clarifying question in terms of really trying to process the timeline here, I think. So if the loans are, are backed up three to six months, where is the real advantage of the six months paid if they apply now? Okay, loans are not backed up three to six months. When I said three to six months, we're talking about lender staff being dedicated to nothing but these loans. Loans are going to be approved within minutes and funded within 72 hours is my understanding. But what the concern is, the back office on all the real SBA lenders, all the processors, the closers, and everyone we've used to close the loans through the entire process are all going to be processing nothing but these loans all day long. So there's no delay in getting the money. It, the delay is their staff is not going to be there to work on the 7A loans. So I hope that, cla that uh, clarifies it. No, th the theory is the application is all online. You submit all the documents, and within hours you're approved, and funding within 72 hours. That is the talk on the street. We'll see if it really happens. It's going to be up to individual lenders. But there should be no delay in getting the money. So I, I think, um, oh, and he actually put this clarifying question in, and this is where I was going. So yes, speaking to the SBA loans, if if those are going to be backed up to 7As, et cetera, where will those six months of paid months come in? Okay, well, if it sounds like there's two different things there. On the 7A acquisitions, they're not going away. Those lenders will be tied up. You have to find lenders that you make sure have availability. That's the big thing. And that's really my message there. If your lender is going to be tied up and you expect them to be off the grid for three to six months, then you need to know that and find another lender. There will be lenders out there filling this hole. I promise you. I know four of them. Okay. So that's the piece. But what you care about is that that's that new 7A lender or that one that's agreed to do your transaction gets that thing closed before September. Because once you pass uh, September 27th, the six-month uh, payments go away. It has to be within six months of 327 when the bill was signed. So, you know, what you need to do is understand if your lender and BDO have the capacity and will be processing 7A loans. Now, what you have to be careful is you don't want them to promise you the world and then find out that, yeah, their back office is sucked into this program and has no availability. And that is the big concern for my high volume BDOs. They're worried about their back office. They're fighting with the higher up saying, you have to leave me a staff member, two staff members, whatever I need, so I can continue to do seven A's. That's what you have to explore and make sure your lender and your BDO is able to do that. If they're not, you have to find one that is, because there are going to be lenders not producing these solely focused on seven A's. And those are the ones that, that we're talking to and you need to find for sure. So just to confirm, mm -hmm. somebody's asked just to confirm, a buyer will not need to pay back the six months the SBA will pay? That is my understanding and it goes on to say this is not a deferment and these payments are made 100% in full by the SBA. That's my understanding of uh, what I read on that so far. And I read it three different places, but like I said, until I see it from the SBA. And I do hear it's out there. I just haven't found it yet. But that is I my understanding. Is yeah, if they close in August, let's say your acquisition transaction happens in August, they're not making payments for the first six months of their loan. And they will be paid for by the SBA. That's a great upside to an acquisition. This is a selling feature, which is why I needed to bring it to your attention. 
Mm -hmm. I think this is a really good question. Um, many folks have asked this just in different ways, but I'm going to go with this variation. I think it's good. As an owner of a brokerage office established as an LLC, I don't have W-2s or 1099s. We take what is left as profit. Does that apply as salary, or can I um, only claim rent and overhead? I don't, you cannot claim rent and overhead at all. And, and here is really the criteria, and I should have probably pointed it out back on the slide. In the PPP program, if you don't have payroll, A, you can't apply at all. But if you do have payroll, your rent, lease payments, and all those other payments uh, or expenses to that employer cannot equal more than 25% of the loan. So no matter what, if I'm going to the SBA saying, hey, under this PPP program, I don't want I want to borrow $100,000, at least 75 has to be allocated toward pay. You can't have more than 25% in expenses, if that makes sense. Hope that was clear. Um, no matter what your PPP loan is, 75% of that has to be allocated toward payroll. That's clear. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, going back to some of these more granular details on requirements, can tips be included for restaurant workers? Yes. From what I read, tips can be. I, and in theory, they should have been claiming them. So it's all legitimately documented. So if they've been reporting in, I would not think that uh, off the book tips are being included, but if they have been including their tips, then from what I understand, their tips are included. So are bonuses and any other compensation. And does that $100,000 cap include taxes and benefits? So that is per employee. So depending upon what your total annual compensation is per employee, yes, the entire expense allocated to him. So if his entire cost to you as an employer was 115,000, you have to reduce that to 100 when you're doing your calculation for your loan. Did that answer the question? I believe so. Yeah, and okay. feel free. Folks, um, if you don't think like your, your question was answered, send, send in a clarifying question. Um, for businesses that have dropped in revenue and starting to build back up, will the banks look at the six month SBA payments in underwriting, which will help a buyer uh, for an acquisition scenario? I'm a little confused on that. Um, it's not yeah, relevant. Let's try reading that. Yeah. For businesses that have dropped in revenue and are starting to build back up, will the banks look at the six month SBA payments and underwriting, which will okay. help buy an acquisition? I get it. So, what you're referring to is the cash flow of the business and the concern. Yes. And, <laughs> and I didn't want to get on this thread either, but I think absolutely. And, and you know, for those of us who, who lived through 09, uh, you know, when we were starting to do transactions in 10 and 11, everybody knew that no one made money in 2009 and 10. Uh, what we're trying to understand now is how we're going to look at this year moving forward. You know, um, I can tell you that the lenders are going to be very lenient on these few months. What we're talking about, and this is all off the record that I shouldn't be sharing, but hey, uh, of crossing off from one to three months of the financials in 2020 as we move forward. Because my big question was, well, come in 2021, what am I gonna do with this business acquisition that lived through 2020 when they were closed for three months, March, April, and May? So th there's nothing official yet, but there's going to be some kind of consideration for that downturn. I don't think in any way, shape or form, Right, it'll affect that acquisition loan this year. We're, we're doing acquisition loans. You know, I did hear some lenders say, hey, we have more concerns about these industries and that industries, but as of right now, we haven't had an industry that we haven't been able to get done. So we have quite a few still in closing and everything is still moving along. So if you're not getting those kind of results, they're out there and you just need to work a little harder or, or push the lenders more or find new lenders, whatever it needs to be. But acquisition deals are still going to happen. 
And then going back to the EIDL, we have a couple folks looking for confirmation. Is that $10,000 coming right away? Um, well, I haven't heard of anybody, to be honest with you, actually get money yet. <laughs> uh, there is a lot of documents su supplied. You're going to be uploading all your tax returns and all of that stuff. It's a full underwriting program. Once you've supplied all the documents, you're issued my understanding, a loan number. I have quite a few clients that have gotten loan numbers but haven't seen the cash yet. So my understanding is once they issue a loan number, within a few days, they're supposed to be contacting you with details. Haven't seen anyone get to that stage yet. So I'm a little unclear on the EIDL. The 10,000, if, if you take the 10,000, which is kind of like the default number, then you can still apply for the PPP program. Anything over and above 10, then you can't. Um, so depending upon how bad you need the money or what it can be used for, you know, what you need it for. But um, that, that's my understanding of the EIDL as of this morning. I did get confirmation. Another one got their loan number, but hasn't seen cash yet. And then what about um, if most of the payroll for a company is paid outside the February through June month last year? Okay, it does address seasonality, if that's what we're talking about. Because what you're looking at, really, which is why they said to go back 12 months, because that, in theory, should, and I'm going to see if I can find it. I'll put the slide back up. But ultimately, uh, let's see if I can find it. Uh, it it's the 12 month average so if you look back 12 months but there is a couple of options for the seasonal and let's see if i have it in front of me i don't but um it is included i think in the documents that i put up on the website you can read the borrower information uh but if you're looking at a 12 month then your average for two and a half months should be the same unless though the big question is well what if you're only busy in march april and may out of the whole year <laughs> then it becomes a, a bigger issue uh, and no one knows how they're going to address that as of yet but in theory it's look back at your 12 month and find your monthly average and do that times two and a half so it should i think take care of the seasonal people but uh, i haven't drilled down on that yet either do we have more questions we do um so sorry these are jumping all different directions but i'm just kind of scrolling and pitching them to you so if uh someone's asked if you are a small business and have a small payroll and most of the money to the owners is in distributions does that count as income for the owners or not no no it's only if you're on the payroll got a w-2 and been paying payroll taxes and taxes on it distributions are out i'm sorry Okay, another question. Are Social Security and Medicare costs included or not included in payroll costs for employees? All right, well, good question. And that did just come up this morning. It's kind of ironic because an attorney called me and said, hey, I'm reading where some of the taxes are excluded. And I was talking to a CPA this morning also about the same issue. I'm not sure they do actually classify there are two of the taxes that your state and local taxes are included but i don't know and i'm waiting for clarification on that that's one of the newest things that just popped up this morning uh if you if you knew that and i'm guessing you saw something on it yesterday or day before there was a little bit of talk but no one's really drilled down on exactly what the 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 consensus with the attorney and cpa this morning was i don't think anyone's going to go through the math and actually sit down with their payroll reports to try and figure out what what taxes are on or off now you got to keep in mind too the underwriters that are cranking these through within minutes don't think they're going to have the capability either so right now as unofficial as this answer is i think i'm including everything you know when i'm describing it to my clients take the payroll divide it by 12 times by two and a half as long as no one made over a hundred thousand that should be your basic payroll number so yeah if, if it does get clarified as far as what taxes are eligible and what ones aren't i'll be happy to share but right now that's still up for debate and how can these programs be used to help a business broker firm with three associates and one principal that's a good question for us here's the most important Thing. 
share the information, get on top. You know, it's a great way to get in touch with your clients base, both your buyers to let them know, hey, if, if you pull the trigger in the next few months, you could have six months of free payments. So it's, it's talking points in my mind. You know, I'm talking to all the people that are in our pipeline right now, making sure, A, they're calm, and B, they know about these programs. You know, it, it's all about sharing information today. You know, we we haven't really tried to, to grow our business over the last 14 days because this is all we've been doing is sharing information. And that's what I think all broker offices should do. Understand, you know, go find that six-month rule. It's out there. You can Google it and see it uh, and start sharing that with people. And if you use the disclosure that I did, hey, I, I don't know if this is official. It sure looks official and I find it everywhere, but it could be a huge advantage to you. So it's a way of showing, hey, you're looking out for them. It's a great, like I said, talking point for all of them, um, both on both sides, on the buyer side and on the seller side, because on the seller side, you want to help all your clients, whether you have the listings or you're thinking about getting the listings or um, you know, someone who closed six months ago. All of those businesses that you're talking to every day need all this information. So I think this is an opportunity to, you know, my saying, leaders be, lead, be leading these days. You know, get that stuff out to them and show you that you're proactive and that you still care about them. That, that's how I think, really, the, my highest level brokers are all over that. They have done nothing these last few days but get, gather information like I did just to present it to their clientele to make sure we're taking care of people. So I think this is really what could set you apart as far as, uh, you know, the other brokers sitting back, just waiting to see things happen and, and fall out. Uh, that's why I have to share. So I, and maybe I, I'm not sure if I'm reading this gentleman's question correctly, but let's look just in case, look at that question from a different angle. So there's one sharing this information so folks can help their clients and try to move some deals forward. But pragmatically, for the operations of a, of a business brokerage firm, in this instance, let's say with three associates and one principal, how can they how can they use these programs? Well, if you have those associates on the payroll, I would definitely say you should apply for a PPP loan. I think everyone they classify it as available for all U.S. businesses. So I don't really care the industry. I'm even thinking whether they were eligible six months ago or not is irrelevant. This states all U.S. businesses. So I think if you conform to these and you had payroll last year and this year, this is a no-brainer. I think that, you know, rent, all of those things, um, everyone should apply for this. I'm encouraging every, every business that I know that I finance and all my friends that own businesses, everyone should be applying for this PPP loan. If you don't have payroll, well, then you got to find another way to, to turn this into a, a upside. And uh, again, I just want to let folks know we will have this posted on the IBBA Member Resource Center this afternoon. I know a lot of people asking about the recording and the slides, so just want to let you know that. Um, a couple more questions here for you, Steve. I know we've got a lot. Um, so we're looking at credit unions, savings banks. Um, this person's asking, what do you, wh who do you recommend contacting? Who do you suggest looking at, giving all these factors that's going to go on in the okay. lending environment? My first suggestion is always, if you matter to a bank, that's the place to go. You know, if you're running money through a checking account, you want to find out if A, they're going to participate in the program and B, get on the list shortly. If your bank is off the table, I'm suggesting you go after the big ones, the Wells Fargo, the Live Oaks, the Bank of Americas. And the reason being is they're going to have the most efficient program. You know, uh, I, I know they're all producing software that's just going to make it simple. And um, so, you know, as opposed to going to the little local banks that are going to muddle through it. So if you can't work with your local bank, then go after one of the big boys. Hmm. Again, this is a profit center. They're going to be cranking these through, which, you know, helps us from, a, from an underwriting perspective. But it's going to be all automated as far as I understand, you know, with very little review. So. So. Um... Lots of questions still coming in in this area, so maybe you can just try to break it down for us again. Folks on this call, let's assume 
you know, 99% of them with us today are business brokers. Um, it sounds like if there's no W-2 or 1099, then they cannot apply for PPP. Is that correct? Well, are they sole props? There are so props are also included. Um, it's going to depend if they're spending all the money and not getting it to the bottom line on any level in, in the shape of a salary or, or some type of uh, officer compensation. Um, but if it is and it's going to your personal tax return, I don't know. Like I said, they, they said that they will include independent contractors and, and self-employed and sole props and everything else. What that looks like and how you get there, I don't know. I know it's going to have to be in payroll on some level. So if it is just distributions or net income that, that you wind up taking under a, you know, a Schedule E or whatever else, they may not be eligible. But there again, it's going to be the local bank. From what I've read, you have to have payroll based on payroll taxes and legitimate journals. You know payroll reports mm -hmm. so and then and let's just say if you are out of that find other ways to capitalize on this like i said go out there it's, it's a great talking tool and you could have more knowledge than most of the people out there so you know get in front of all those clients and let, let's get listings sorry go ahead i think another area where people seem to be looking for clarity um there's, there seems to be some understanding that up to 25% of the PPP loan amount could be used for rent, utilities, mortgage interest, et cetera. But that portion was not forgiven. Only the portion used on payroll was forgiven. Can you confirm, clarify that for us? No, my understanding is that it's all forgiven, including all those expenses, unless those expenses uh, uh, exceed 25%. It's only excluded if you exceed 25% or you reduce your payroll. But um, no, my understanding is that's part of the loan request. There's no reason to calculate all that stuff if it's not going to be included in our loan request because then they would be thinking, well, you'd be increasing your payroll to make up for that 25%, but that's not the case. So my understanding is though all of those expenses are completely covered under that covered loan that includes 75% of that loan must be for payroll, but the other 25% is still included in that covered loan and is forgiven. There's no question in my mind because that's what the lenders have been talking about for the last bunch of days and there's never been a, a, a waffle on that. Okay, another point of clarification here. Um, if you take an EIDL loan, confirm, clarify, you can or cannot take a PPP. Some sources say you can, but you can't double dip on the use of the funds. Can you go through that one more time? Well, this is my understanding. If you take the 10, that can then be rolled into the PPP. If you take more than 10, then it can't be. But I, I've seen it in writing where it says you cannot secure both programs. So I don't know where someone, you, you could do it temporarily, the EIDL, because there was no PPP and there still isn't today. So that's why they said, hey, 10,000, you know, if you're that small and you need 10,000 right away, do that until the PPP comes out. But um, my understanding is once you get past 10,000, then you're off the table for the PPP. Hmm. If a business had payroll in the last quarter of 2019, but no payroll for 2020 yet, will the business qualify for PPP? I think so, because really, if you look back at your last 12 months, I mean, it might be a much smaller number because you're only using three months worth of payroll to allocate it over a 12-month period. There is also some, some writings about new businesses that started this year. So I don't know if it will fall under that or if it will fall under, you know, probably have to look at what's best for you and what applies more. But in the last 12 months, it was still the fourth quarter of 2019. Um, with no payroll this year, that amount still qualifies in my mind. Now keep in mind, you still have to keep your other expenses under 25% of whatever that payroll number was, but still get what you can. Good question here. If you own multiple businesses, should you apply for each of them? And what if one business owns the other? Oh, now you're getting a little deeper than me. But if I own four businesses, I would be applying under each four of the businesses' names. Absolutely. 
Uh, I don't know if one business owns another one because one of them is going to have no payroll, I'm going to guess. So whichever one has the payroll is the one that has to apply. So if someone owns them, I don't think it's irrelevant. I mean, I do think it's irrelevant. I don't think the ownership really matters. I'm going after the company and corporation that has the payroll expense, you know, as far as the application goes. Uh, would a landscaping company be excluded from an E? And then, I think yeah, they mean the, um, yeah, the EIDL. Mm -hmm. No, my understanding is it's all U.S. businesses. I'm not excluding anyone. I think anyone that fits the criteria should absolutely apply. And do employ do the employees or 1099s of the business need to be U.S. citizens? I do know on the application, and I am looking at it, it does ask if I am a U.S. citizen or, so this is what it says, initial, initial here to confirm your response to question six, I am a U.S. citizen or I have lawful permanent residence or no. <laughs> I'm going to have to think if you click no, you're out. So I'm going to think that it comes down to, well, you can't be in America illegally and qualify for the program. That's what it comes down to. But green card's fine, U.S. citizens are fine, if that answers the question. Hmm. Well, yeah, I think in this scenario, to be clear, it's wondering if the employees um, have to be U.S. citizens. If it's a no. U.S. citizen who owns no. the business. Yeah, no, no, no. We're not looking at the employees at all. The only place anyone's ever going to see the employee name is on your payroll report, where you prove um, Joe didn't make over $100,000. And that report is also what's used to calculate the two and a half months. But other than that, they're not going to have any interaction with the employee whatsoever. So it's irrelevant. Okay. So uh, I know we're going, uh, so far we're going to run about 10 minutes past our hour. We're trying to get to as many of these as we can. Steve, do you have time for just maybe one or two more? Of course I do. All right, thank you. Um, again, folks, you will find the recording of this up on the IBBA Member Resource Center. Um, trying to scroll here. It's still unclear whether we, this is the question, it is still unclear whether we need to request the auto payments from SBA. Do you understand you do. that question? I do. Okay. Yes. I tell every single client, you absolutely have to ask for them. A lot of lenders are not calling their clients saying, hey, you can do this. So I advise every single client that I have SBA loan with to call their lender and find out about it and put themselves on that list too. Same thing with the deferments. But yeah, it's going to be up to the borrower. The, the lenders, some are being aggressive and calling their clientele and helping them out, but a lot of them are not. So it's got to okay. be proactive. And I think maybe, I know this is an area where people are just trying to understand it, wrap their heads around it. So this is maybe a good wrap-up question here that encompasses a couple parts. So for clarity, a current 7A loan can get an EIDL, have it converted to the PPP, have payroll rent utilities forgiven, and get three months deferred plus six months payment paid by the SBA? That is my understanding. Because they should have gotten the three-month deferment already. So what the SBA is saying, hey, if you already did that, because we encouraged every single lender to do that, that doesn't kick you out of any of these programs. So, yes, that's correct. He, they could actually go that nine months without payments. So, Steve, I want to personally thank you for spending this time with us. I know you are very busy right now. We all, always appreciate how generous you are with educating our community. Um, those of you that are with us as members, again, we'll have this recording available in your webinar library. Also, we'll say it again, it's such an important time to stay connected and in touch and in using all of your member resources. Um, ask a CBI, hop in on a happy hour. We had our first member happy hour yesterday. It was fantastic. Get in on one of those. Um, white papers, other webinars coming out. I anticipate we'll probably have Steve back as things evolve and we all continue to know more. So look for those additional webinar announcements. 
And again, Steve, just thank you so much for being here with us today. Any closing comments for our group? Oh, it's been my pleasure. I am all about educating everybody, but I, I, you have to look at this as an opportunity. And, and I do think the broker community has to take control of the uh, buyer sellers and, and keep acquisitions moving. So, uh, you know, stay safe, everyone. Um, I'll be putting out more information as it becomes, you know, more in stone. But uh, no, I want to thank you all for being able to share all this information. This is, a, this is important stuff for everyone to know and share it with as many people as you can. That's all. Thank you all. Yes, and thank you to our audience for being here today. Stay safe, stay healthy, and be well. Enjoy the rest of your day. Okay. Thank you, Colleen.